Thank you very much. I hope uh, this gives you an insight on a little bit on financial inclusion and how the CAFUL or other microfinance, microinsurance can actually enhance the impact of microfinance. Because as you can see, these are the circumstances of ordinary people. A small mishap and they default on the loan. There is no choice. And when they default on the loan, they start from zero again. Next time they go, they say, you defaulted last time. I can't give you a loan. And so we end up with a bigger mess. The question is, how can we leverage our micro takaful or our assistance to help them not to default, not to go down the ladder and snakes continuously, but stay up and go up. And tomorrow we are also trying to address the question whether some part of zakat can be used for some of the micro takaful premiums for this kind of activity. This is a challenge for scholars. The challenge for historical understanding of jurisprudence, but circumstances are changing and possibilities are changing. If we don't do very much, then Facebook and Libra will lure, rule us. So we have to really learn how to rule ourselves. Okay, that's enough. We are on time to start our Responsible Finance Summit. Uh, I see some... Uh, old friends now joining us in the audience, and so we can begin. The idea of the Responsible Finance Summit came to us about six months ago that we are doing at the Kaful Summit. Can we add a day, just over a day, for responsible finance? As you know, over the last year at least, there has been a lot of build-up of sustainable finance, renewables, responsible finance, climate change, climate disaster. Every day you open the news and you see something. What I and we wanted to do was to put these things into perspective and see how to look at them systematically so that we can probably begin not only to understand but do our small bits wherever we can. One of them, something like that and all kinds of other things. So it has fallen upon me to outline the evolution of the sustainability imperative. I can take you back <clears throat> to my undergraduate economics lessons. And the professors there obviously brought up in the free market culture, neoliberalism, so the markets are the only thing which can work. Get rid of all these states and state interventions. If you remember early, late 60s, early 70s, there were still quite a number of states experimenting with socialism. Not because they understood socialism, I must say, but because they were colonized under capitalism. So it was a natural thing. We can't follow the colonizers. We have to do something else. So you had Islamic socialism in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in India, the Nehruvian version, in parts of Africa, and Nkrumah, and so on, all over the place. Uh, even in South America, you had all these experiments with socialism. And our professors were saying, these are all crazy guys. They leave the markets, and then they will never come back to any level of growth or economic development. And this was obviously backed up by the World Bank and slowly evolved into what, was, what came to be known as the Washington Consensus, that help and aid was only available if you subscribe to the market mechanism. However, <clears throat> Even before that time, let me take you to one day, I think in the late, 19, uh, late 1880s, on a hot summer day like today, 
parliament was still sitting and parliament had to be suspended because the Thames was stinking like hell. MPs just couldn't tolerate the smell. They had to suspend parliament and go home. The smell was coming from raw sewage being dumped upstream in the Thames, flowing, yes, into the <laughs> sea. So there was no control on dumping. Uh, first sewage, then chemicals, all kinds of effluents, and so on. If you look at it from an economics perspective, for a producer of sewage, for example, or collector of sewage, or for a producer of chemicals, it doesn't make economic sense to process them, make them harmless, and dispose them responsibly. It is a cost. So it's easier to dump it into the river nearby and go home. And that is what Economics 101 was saying. We then started towards the end of our uh, undergraduate studies to think about what came to be known as externalities. Externalities are things which are not possible to be taken care of by one party because externalities also bring a question of free riding. If I spend everything, you can free ride on my effort and benefit from it. So externalities, by definition, has to bring in regulation, and by extension, when you bring regulation, you have to bring the state. And therefore, the idea evolved that you cannot entirely do without the state. Since then, a lot of things have evolved and we have now the biggest discussion even in uh, our economies here, what is the balance between state and market? I told you about effluents in the river even last week or two weeks ago, even today. Our biggest water companies have been fined for dumping <laughs> the same kind of stuff free of charge. So it's not really changed much. If you leave it to them, there is no incentive to deliver on those things. We have to begin to regulate this uh, activity properly, but fairly regulate so that the incidence and the cost is also distributed fairly, because if you don't distribute the cost fairly, then obviously it will fall disproportionately on sectors which cannot object, but which have to bear it. So I think those were, in my view, in recent times, the beginnings of the idea of sustainability. Before that, again at the university, we were very uh, keen or taught keenly about a, an economist called Malthus. Malthus was of the opinion that humankind will reproduce itself to extinction. And he said, when you don't control your birth rates, you go on and on, you will die of hunger and famine, and then the whole cycle will start again. That's how it goes. Don't think about doing anything about it. Just get on with it. So you had all kinds of people who were bringing out all kinds of apocalyptic <laughs> scenarios to say what to do. But I think after the Second World War and the need and the evolution of the welfare state, uh, people began to understand that we are all in this together. If you don't take care of the most uh, deprived sections, the whole of society will suffer. We have to put a safety net under everybody so that we can thrive as one. 
And this was the unique contribution of the second, uh, post-Second World War settlement that Europe pioneered this idea. And up to today, we are wedded to the welfare state in one way or another, obviously less in some countries, more in others. And still, when you talk about the welfare state, people go and mention the, uh, what we call the Scandinavian dispensation as a best practice example of the welfare state. However, things evolve, and in 1972, a very interesting report was published. This report, still available on the net, and it has been updated many times by the authors and their uh, colleagues and successors, and it is called The Limits to Growth by Meadows and his wife Meadows and two other scholars. They said that, look, because you remember that time, 70s, now we are also looking at the development paradigm that everybody must become like us, as wealthy, as prosperous, and so on. They're fine, it's very good if everybody can do that. Can you imagine the implications of that? So we started to think on that time that if every Chinese family wanted a car, what would happen to the demand for steel, for petrol, and for so on? Can we afford it? Even simple things that if every Chinese family wanted to have cereals for breakfast, what would happen for the demand for milk? Let alone if they began to grow to our levels of consumption or the U.S. levels of consumption for that matter. And Meadows and Meadows blew the minds of people who could think that really this was not possible. We have to do something. Either we keep the poor as poor so that they don't consume more, or we have to think of something else. On top of that, we had the beginnings of another challenge coming through. Those of you who know or who have read about the ozone layer, the ozone layer is a layer in the atmosphere which mitigates the level of UV uh, rays from the sun's radiation. UV rays, excessive UV rays, it uh, is now known, causes a larger incidence of carcinogenic melanoma, which is a kind of cancer. So if you deplete the ozone layer, then the incidence of cancer will increase. And I will show you some other things about it which are a little bit interesting as well. The problem with CFCs, which is the cause for depletion of the ozone layer, they were mostly emitted by refrigerants and these aerosols, which we always uh, you know, use them for uh, air fresheners and all, all kinds of things, all that emits CFCs, goes into the atmosphere. It is a self-sustaining chain reaction which eats into the ozone layer. And then you get an increase in UV radiation and so on. So under the United Nations, there was an effort to try to organize to see what to do about it. Of course, at that time, the use of refrigeration or aerosols in non-developed countries was quite minimal. So the emissions were mostly from developed countries and the controls had to be from developed countries. As it happens that the worst impact of the ozone layer were on the people from Europe from colder climates who had migrated, migrated to hotter climates, like people from Europe migrating to Australia or New Zealand 
or Canada or wherever, and South America, the incidence of cancer on them was just unbelievable. The local people with darker skins were much more adapted to this radiation, so the incidence was lower. So now obviously there is a trade-off here, right? If I'm in the south, I say, it doesn't affect me, so why are you bothering me? But if I'm in the south, having migrated from here, I'm uniquely exposed. This put us in a very interesting situation that people began to realize that we are living in an interconnected world. We are not living in isolated islands or countries where what we do within our borders impacts us, what we don't do doesn't impact anybody. We realize that if the Chinese start to emit CFCs, it will impact us, and vice versa, and so on. So it became now a question of whether the globe can cooperate on this basis. That is why today, and we will come to that, the sort of erosion of the importance of UN institutions to mediate these global accords is going to be very problematic because there is no way to solve climate change or other things without this cooperation and limits on everything. So ultimately, after years of negotiations, we were able to negotiate the Kyoto Protocol uh, in trying to limit the CFC emissions. One of the things which we couldn't do we were arguing from the South that if technologies were developed which would allow the use of alternatives to CFCs, the royalties on these technologies should be waived for developing countries. Because otherwise, it will be the same problem. You are paying twice for that. Because as you realize, uh, not many people realize immediately that as countries become slightly more developed and they become, they begin to urbanize, there is a great need for the food chain from the farm to the city to be preserved intact. And refrigeration plays a critical role in this. It's not the home refrigerator but to bring the food and keep it fresh until it is bought through in the market. And that is where most of the technology was needed in order to allow that. Uh, if you, uh, some of you may have and some of you may wish to go if you go to some other countries now even where the refrigeration is not adequate, you go to the markets and you see the state of fruits and vegetables, you'll see that it is not as impeccable as you might find in your supermarkets here. In your supermarkets here, you see the amount of refrigeration which is being used, but that has a cost on the back in terms of both carbon emissions, CFC emissions, and so on. So we had to discuss that, but it, it was very much work in progress. We couldn't get the multinationals or even the companies to take that on very much further, right? But the idea that we will have to have some kind of cooperation between the emitters of these uh, things and the people who will suffer from it. And this goes on. And then academics now started to think about this. We started to get this idea. <clears throat> now you imagine at that time each American was consuming probably 80 times the resources of each Chinese in terms of all the kinds of things they used to use, cars and these refrigerators, clothes, whatever, whatever, whatever. So he said, look, you have already utilized your share of the global ecological capital. You better cut it to zero and let us develop. Instead of saying that you people stay where you are, 
and don't do anything else. So this is now a big debate, right? You're saying to them, you have used your global ecological capital, let somebody else do something. There's also, of course, things like logging of forests and things coming in, in terms of destroying the remaining carbon sinks uh, of the world. To give you another example, which is uh, also quite interesting, we had, uh, <clears throat> you know, um, the Japanese use chopsticks to eat. If you use wooden chopsticks and you use five sets a day, how many forests will you destroy? Think about it. I just say, my God, they should just stop using chopsticks, for God's sake, eat with their hands or whatever. But that is not culture, yeah? So unfortunately, at that time, the Japanese begin to understand, but they move to plastic chopsticks, which is another problem as it comes on. So we solve one and we create another one. But you can see the kind of debate which was coming in people, that now we got to think through what is going to happen. Only two months ago you saw, uh, and okay, in the 80s, we had this discussion at the World Bank. I was with the World Bank NGO committee at that time. We started to discuss these things. The chief economist of the World Bank, those of you who know will know the name, I don't need to give the name, I just need to give you the idea. Yes, kind of, uh, well, he says it was in jest, but we thought it is quite serious. He said, what is wrong in dumping toxic waste on people and populations which are underpolluted if you are paying them? This is a free market version. You're paying them, we're dumping them, they are underpopulated and underpolluted, he said. And it created an uproar, but that was what it is. But you can see even today, we now get countries like Philippines and Malaysia and so on sending back plastic waste to us that you are dumping it here and take care of it yourself. And now if it comes here, what are we going to do with it? Because this is now not biodegradable. We have to store it. Or we have to, I don't know, what we can do with it. Obviously, ultimately, it will lead us to change our habits of using one-time plastic use. But these debates were already in the making at that time. I'm trying to give you from different angles to show you how this paradigm is building up in different populations. One more example before I give you uh, a few more thoughts. In the 80s, we had the evolution and then the establishment of GATT, which was the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, and then followed by the WTO, WTO, which is now the World Trade Organization, which regulates trades and tariffs between countries and uh, people who are members of. This is a UN organization as well. The question was, <clears throat> tobacco companies, were becoming increasingly aware that resistance to smoking and movements against smoking in developed markets were limiting the growth of their companies because the markets were not growing. Although tobacco is quite resistant, even today if you buy a, just go and buy a packet of cigarettes, it says, this product can kill you. You are happily buying, opening it, and smoking. So it is quite a <laughs> quite a addictive product. But <clears throat> the question came that in developing countries, obviously in some countries, smoking was quite widespread. Like in Indonesia, for example, they have this Indonesian version of cigarettes, Kartek, yes, which was quite widespread. But in other countries, not so widespread, and specifically, not widespread amongst women. 
men used to smoke. So if you go to Pakistan, Arif Bhai, you see that men smoke, women don't generally smoke, right? It's not acceptable socially in Pakistan or India. And if a tobacco company comes and say, what is the market for my product in this market? And they've chosen Thailand as a test case. They said the low hanging fruit for this market is women of childbearing age. They wanted to promote tobacco smoking amongst women of childbearing age. Now with what we know about smoking, the worst cohort to smoke are women of childbearing age. And when we resisted as NGOs, they sued us in GATT. They said this is protectionism against our products. And they wanted to you know, win that case and then it created a furor. It's still going on. The freedom, because part of the GATT uh, agreements was the uh, investment treaties and intellectual property rights and all kinds of things and under that you could not stop this kind of activities. Obviously on top of all kinds of underhand methods, yeah? So for example, the uh, chairman of British land at that time, British land, of course, not British land, but uh, one of the vehicle companies who later became chairman of BAT, British American Tobacco, he's quite famous in saying that what is wrong in bribing Vogue's? to get these things done, man. I mean, they're not people. So this discussion in the board of that company was taped by Tariq Ali and released. You can still search on Google and you'll find it. And it was toxic. But you can see the mindset which was there from the chief economists of the World Bank to uh, leaders of leading multinationals and so on that really this was a problem which can be just passed on. However, as things begin to build up, we are finding that this will not do. We are now reaching the limits of what the world can tolerate. Just before we go to some discussion on this, and uh, some more points, it is my friend Jose Lutzenberger who was then the Minister of Environment of Brazil. He told us that, look guys, you come to Brazil and you say, look, only half the forest is destroyed. There's still a lot of time left. We can do something about it. Leave it, let it go on. He said, you do not understand that forests are ecosystems. They cannot survive without the whole system surviving. And he gave us an example and I'll show you. Consider that this is the forest. Now you say that here half is gone, but now see what happens. When half is gone, the whole can disappear without notice because the ecosystem is no longer viable. So you say environmental problems have to be looked at as a holistic problem. You can't say, let us pick and choose and destroy some bits and then forget about the rest. No, you have to be really careful and act hard on it and go from there. So, we come now 20 years, 25 years on, with a lot of understanding of these things, a lot of data being collected, a lot of thinking, a lot of lobbying, a lot of campaigning by people who want to now begin to be aware you have um, countries like Maldives who quite rightly think that if we continue as we are, they will drown. They will no longer exist. Parts of Bangladesh will no longer exist and so on because the sea level will rise from the melting ice and that will be that. So we have reached a moment where we need to now look at it from a different angle from a global angle, but from a responsible angle as well. Now I'm bringing